so this session is about uh, dynamic languages, ma making them perform, implementing them so they can run on the JVM, and uh, making them perform. And uh, this is from the perspective of the Nashorn project, which is the JavaScript engine written in pure Java that comes with uh, JDK 8. And um, this started out as a, a War Stories talk for Java Language Summit this summer, uh, with like 80 people like me uh, in, in, in the room, the only 80 people like me in the world. So I hope that I adapted it a little bit. I still won't, I mean, you still won't need the seat belts. I won't crash into anything, but I'll, I'll do my best to keep it on a good level, but it's gonna be pretty technical. But the, again, GoTo is a pretty technical conference. So I'm sure if you're here, you'll do fine. Uh, my colleague Rickard suggested uh, when I did this talk that it should have an alternative title, uh, which would be enough because uh, JavaScript, man, it's um, it's not the best, the most ideal language you've ever had to implement, and I've implemented a few languages in my time. So um, I work for Oracle, Telltale slide there, legal. Um, my name is Marcus Lagergren. You can follow me on, follow me on Twitter as Lagergren. And uh, I am originally one of the JRocket guys who was the co-generator architect for the JRocket machine for a long time. And uh, after adventures back and forth, I ended up in the Java language team at Oracle in 2011, where I've been working on dynamic languages ever since. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here because GoTo is, is one of my more favorite conferences when I look at the program, but I never, never make it here for various reasons. The last time I was here was in 2001, and also I think that Denmark can be a little bit scary. But <laughs> so, sometimes more than a little bit scary, actually. Um, but, I mean, Swedes have uh, successfully uh, gone to Denmark before, uh, and, and participated in the cultural exchange. So, um, so, so I, I'm feeling pretty confident anyway. Um, I'm here to talk about what we suffered through so far uh, when we implemented a dynamic language on the JVM, um, which is a Nasrum project. And that is still a hippo, damn it, I forgot to change it for this presentation. At least I think it's a hippo. It's a nice graffiti picture. And for entertainment purposes, uh, beside the technical stuff, I will also parade you some JavaScript horrors that I always do in the order to vaccinate the world against what is taking over the IT industry for obscure reasons. So, agenda, what is Nasrin and why? Um, the problem of representing something as bytecode that didn't used to be Java, I call this an alien language to the Java virtual machine. And Java bytecode is called Java bytecode with Java, so that's why you got this whole alien thing going. Uh, it involves types, which we don't have in dynamic languages typically, and that the bytecode does have. It involves doing uh, optimistic assumptions so that you can get some speed because you can't represent everything as Java lang objects and preserve the uh, speed of your implementation. And then uh, what is the JVM doing with invoke dynamic? What are its issues and how can it be faster? So this is not a presentation about Nasr and in depth is why, but I introduce it a little bit for those of you who hasn't, haven't heard about it. Um, it's a 100% pure Java runtime for JavaScript, just like Rhino used to be, or like Rhino is. And uh, we uh, implement JavaScript by generating bytecodes for the uh, virtual machine. But the difference between, between us and Rhino is that we use invoke dynamics everywhere for getters and setters and calls and everything that basically can change in a dynamic language runtime, the way it was intended. And uh, Nasorn currently performs somewhere on the order of, well, it's like pulling some figures out of the air here, two to, the time, two to 10 times better than Rhino in any arbitrary work, in the arbitrary job. It's in uh, JDK 8. It is also fully ECMA script compliant, which means that we run the 11 something thousand test, tests from ECMA that uh, makes sure we can call ourselves JavaScript. We were actually the first JavaScript implementation in the world to do that. I mean, V8 had 98% when we had 100 or something, but I don't think we are anymore. Not that it matters overly much, but we had to make sure we were compliant before we started tweaking performance dials. And we have a well thought through security model. That's the reason we haven't gotten as far uh, in performance work as, as we uh, wanted, because for some reason, I mean, you might have heard of it, but there have been some security issues with Java. I couldn't possibly comment, but there's been some resources um, <coughs> taken up uh, by that. So Nasrin started out in 2010, late 2010, I think, as a, a proof of concept for Invoke Dynamic. 
uh, Brian was talking about uh, in his last session. Can we use Invoke Dynamic to efficiently implement a dynamic language on the JVM? And in order to do that, we sort of had to try. So it, one thing led to another, and there was a lot of stuff going on. And we picked JavaScript because Rhino is still alive after 18 years. And, and one, might under, one, one might think that is strange because it was written in 1995 in Java and it's patched, patched over again. It's an old, slow, quite ugly beast. But the reason people use Rhino is that they can use the JSR223 uh, JavaFX, JavaX scripting API to communicate with the JDK. You get access to Java and the underlying platform from the JavaScript program. So you can do hybrid programming. So people actually use Rhino in new projects today, and we wanted to provide a modern alternative. So Nazorn is now mature, and if this is Rhino, this is what we're replacing it with. Something for the a clean room implementation for the modern world of a robotic rhinoceros. I'm actually going to show you a performance slide now. You shouldn't take too much heed to it, because it's Nazorn normalized against Rhino, and high is good on, on, on the Octane benchmarks from part of the V8 suite. Uh, and they're sort of the spec JVM 98 of the JavaScript world. You can't read too much into them. You can write perfectly functional killer web apps with Nashorn and uh, use it as part of a node-like um, semantics in the Avatar JS project that was announced last week at Java 1. So uh, this is just the beginning. It might be interesting to notice that some of these bars, I don't have any like native runtime figures to compare with here, but uh, some things like display benchmarks, we are already faster than V8, which is a native implementation, mainly due to us being able to utilize some really good garbage collectors in the uh, uh, in the J JVM. So, so this is just a beginning, and uh, going to spend a significant uh, amount of time in this presentation and uh, talking about how we're going to get further. So, Nazorn is already uh, available in the OpenJDK builds. You can download it today in the bin directory next to Java. You got the JDS REPL, which you can start and gives you the uh, JavaScript. Uh, uh, interpreter, where you can just try out what Nathron does. It's the default JavaScript script engine. So try it out today. So um, I did a, a rather in-depth thing on Nathron, or like people, other people in the media did, and I did as well as Java 1 last week. So as long as video comes up, it should be pretty soon. I encourage you to check those out if you want to know more about the actual product, because that was pretty cool, including the little Twitter-based game that we implemented quickly in the uh, JavaScript script bowl, where you tweet it up and down to your rhinoceri that moved across the screen as a typical example of things you can do quickly with a uh, hybridized programming in Java and JavaScript. Anyway, that's not what we're here today for. Today we're here for the technologies involved in compiling an alien language to Java bytecode. And um, as Brian said, there's an abstraction layer, this layer of indirection, which Invoke Dynamic gives us. Bytecode itself is a layer of indirection. Um, it usually looks like this when you try to get something that's not Java to work on the virtual machine. I mean, you can usually do it. It's Turing complete, but it's really hard to like get the exact semantics right. Um, JavaScript doesn't fit extremely well into the mold of Java bytecode. Scala fits better into the like it, turning it into Java bytecode, but it's not pain-free. Um, there are things like hardtail call optimizations, uh, interface injection traits, etc., that don't exist in the virtual machine. And also Java Language Summit this summer, uh, I saw a Scala talk about the actual internals they have to do to get like squeeze the type system into uh, uh, in, into Java bytecode, and that made me gave me some mental scars that I still have. But uh, Scala. Uh, is a fairly good fit compared to more dynamic languages like JavaScript and Ruby. That we can certainly say, because in Java, JavaScript and Ruby, we don't have any types, any explicit types. Things change at runtime a lot. In Ruby, you can just like add an instance field to, to the class you're working with right now, uh, with the um, at operator. Um, you can uh, replace a function with another. Well, you can, you can pretty much replace built-ins in JavaScript, replace math sign with something that returns 17. So, so there's a lot of pain to like, handle this, which brings more overhead to what you're doing. And Invoke Dynamic it certainly alleviates a lot of the pain, because if you have a, po a, a call site that goes from A to B, and someone says that it should not go to C, that's exactly what Invoke Dynamic is for. It behaves like a function pointer. Boom, new target problem solved. So that kind of thing, uh, it, it alleviates a lot. 
And it also helps you with the combinators, not having to generate explicit bytecode. We're going to look at that a little bit. But plenty of stuff remains to be solved. So looking at JavaScript as my example, it uh, was obviously deliberate, deliberately designed to make every efficient representation of everything you ever do uh, useless. Um, if you say that prototypes, for instance, if you go into JavaScript, the array prototype, and say that array prototype of 1 is 17, that means that the second element of every array in, in JavaScript forevermore, until you change it, will be 17. So the obvious, uh, the obvious representation, if you go on a bytecode to represent a JavaScript array, is just a Java array. That's obviously not going to work. Same thing with the sparse array. You can have uh, an array with billions of elements. Not really, but you can have an index of a billion. You can have something that looks like an array, and then suddenly you say, well, this with the key string, something is blah, blah, and then suddenly it turns into a map. So there's a lot of stuff like this in JavaScript that you have to think carefully about when you have an underlying implementation. Numbers is one of the harder problems if you're trying to do this as bytecode uh, because of strongly typed bytecode and loosely typed JavaScript. A number in JavaScript has no fixed range. It's intish or it's doublish. It's X number of bits. It's really just a number is what you can talk about. You can't say that it's a 32-bit Java int or a 64-bit Java double. Uh, and this is not very nice because strongly typed bytecode expects exactly this from you. So, so overflows must be handled. If you have two very large positive integers and add them together in Java, you get a negative integer because you get an overflow, and that's how Java is defined to work. In, in JavaScript, you get a larger number that takes more than 32 bits to represent. So just using int opcodes and hope that we don't overflow, I mean, you can't do that because sometimes you overflow. Uh, conservatively, and I'm going to do this presentation going from like how can we conservatively represent JavaScript, at least to its correct, as bytecode, and then, OK, optimistically there's performance, how should we do our guesses? So I'll start conservatively by saying that at least the number in JavaScript uh, tend to fit in a Java double, no matter what number it is. Sometimes this is not true, but I'm not going to not gonna go into that particular can of worms. Let's say that doubles are good enough for numbers in JavaScript because it's most of the case. And of course, double arithmetic, if you look on modern hardware, is slower than integer arithmetic. Like it, it can be no other way. Um, but interestingly enough, and irritatingly enough, uh, is that double arithmetic sometimes is faster than int arithmetic if you have to add an overflow check. Say that you add two large integers together and want to see, OK, did it just overflow? Just doing the check without, I'm not sure what we were taught in uh, university, but I think it's like two XORs and an AND, uh, and maybe a sub to implement an overflow check for int. So it's a couple of extra instructions. And I would think that at least it's still going to be faster than double, but double arithmetic is pretty fast on, on modern architectures. Way slower than pure int without the overflow check, though. So getting back to that, it seems, um, seems scary that I can't do integer arithmetic with JavaScript semantics. Uh, implementing that in a good way. Um, so types and numbers again. Hotspot, the virtual machine, was originally, of course, tested and developed with bytecode that came from Java. That's what all the optimizations originally were based on. Um, so when you presented with stuff that wasn't Java, the pattern matches might not be nearly as good, but we got JIT people working on that. Uh, the other approach you can have to this, am I an int or a double, how do I handle overflows? And I mean, you can add something, you can add a string to an int in JavaScript and get a string. Uh, so maybe you have to represent everything as objects, which is the most conservative case at all, uh, to get the bytecode performance to be as type agnostic as you need to be able to implement JavaScript or Ruby. But that's, that's nowhere near viable performance-wise. Uh, even if Hotspot were good at removing boxing, which it is not, uh, it, it would not be fast. So the key to performance is to try to use primitive operations as bytecode whenever possible. Um, I feel a bit constrained about the bytecode format as my uh, compile time target, being an old compiler writer that has to have various native assembly dialects as my compile time target. But uh, that's the way it is in this high-level project. Uh, but at least we can work with the JVM to make it faster. So for bytecode performance, we should at least use whatever static types we can prove. 
which Nazrin does. I mean, if you see a multiplication in JavaScript, you know that it has to work on numbers because that's the way the JavaScript specification is done. And then um, that doesn't take you all the way towards performance. So you optimistically have to assume a lot of stuff about types as well. Say that this is probably an int and uh, take a penalty if I'm wrong, if it suddenly turns into something else and, and like figure out what the state was and, and use another representation. And uh, we're on that and it seems to be working really well so far. Um, so JavaScript, let's start with the static type info. Um, this is my first compiler. I've written a compiler since I was 17 or something, but this is my first compiler for a dynamic typeless language. Uh, and um, you can still infer some static types by looking at JavaScript, something like that. You know, if you have like bitwise operations like not and bitwise and and or an XOR, uh, the JavaScript specification tells you that this has to, whatever you put in as operators must be queers to ints before you run the operation. So there you have some static information. Even if, if you don't know what the operators are, you still know that before the operation takes place, they have to be turned into ints. And um, for other arithmetic operations, except for add, you can turn them into a JavaScript number according to the same kind of rules. It's only the add operator, the plus, that can add strings and arbitrary things together. Uh, that is um, pretty much the hardest one to do statically. Uh, any static assumptions about. Um, and this shows why it's a really bad idea to overload operators. So, in the static type info case, how do we deal with parameters? Here is a Java method called square. Its sole purpose is to take an integer x and return the square of x. You can see int twice here in Java, which is a nice strongly typed language. Um, below you see the bytecode that results from compiling this method. It's actually probably not what Java C writes. This is bytecode that my brain wrote, but it will be semantically equivalent for Java. You basically load the uh, zeros par parameter, duplicate what's on the bytecode stack, do a multiplication, and do a return. And these are all instructions that begin with I, which mean they handle JavaScript, sorry, they handle Java ints, and Java ints only. And if you were trying to force a double into the square method by engineering bytecode for it, you'd get a verify error, because that's the Java sandbox model for types, right? But in JavaScript, the equivalent function just says function square x, return x times x. So square of 2 is 4, square of 2.1 is 441, 4.41, and square of a is a well-defined nan. All of, all of this is valid JavaScript if you apply the uh, um, multiplication operator to, to the three different types involved here. So it's not as simple as I showed you in the last slide. We can't just like have an int method that works an int. Uh, we have to we have to still conservatively to make this work. We have to make sure it takes an object. So I changed the descriptor from taking an object from taking int to taking an object. I load the object with an a prefixed bytecode instruction, which deals with objects, not ints. Um, JavaScript spec says that before I do a multiplication. At least I can trust the multiplication to be on number, number operands anyway, but before I do the multiplication, I have to query these operands to, uh, to numbers, which I represent as doubles in bytecode, so I have some queries to double, which hopefully just takes a Java lang integer or a Java lang double that you sent in as this object and unboxes it, which would still be pretty fast. It's not the string case here. I duplicate whatever I have. I do a double multiplication because that's allowed. The precision will be enough. Conservative to JavaScript, and I return a double. I've changed the return uh, call site type to double because that's the widest the multiplication can ever be in JavaScript. But I mean, it's still starting to look slow. And guess again, we can do this in JavaScript. We can say that whatever we send in is an object whose value of property I've overridden with a function that modifies a global state. So. They can throw an exception, they can do anything. When I do the coercion to double for the multiplication, I have to queries x twice. First parameter, second parameter. So this um, conservative thing where I just dupe the coercion result has to turn into this. I basically have to load it twice, queries it twice if it modifies a global state, do the multiplication and return. So you can see we're still starting to get significantly slower than what we think of as normal Java bytecode already. Uh, there's a lot of magic in, in, in the number creation in JavaScript. Uh, you can create an object, you can set its value of key to format hard drive function, and then 
much later when you do like plus plus for this object, the equation semantics will force format hardware function to be called. So this is uh, it's a pretty sick language to work with, but at least you can glean some some uh, information from the uh, uh, from, from from the operators. Um, this turns into the string 10, of course, uh, in JavaScript, due to the creation rules. Because the empty array, when you do a unary plus, it converts it into a number, which is 0, and so on, inner arrays, and etc. Uh, this is the Fibonacci calculator written in JavaScript that uh, relies on the type collection rules to um, calculate Fibonacci sequences. You add the underscore variable there is the nth number you want. Um, so, what we can do to help with the square function that turned into a very, uh, very much an object heavy method that always takes an object is to specialize on call sites because perhaps still conservatively, conservatively we see something like var a, uh, a equals b times square of 17.0. And even if someone overwrites square with something else, we know at this call site in the program at least that the result of square is always used in the multiplication. And the parameter to square is always a double. So no matter what square is, we know that the, we can query the return value to a double in our bytecode representation and the parameters. So um, let's ignore int overflows for a bit. Um, we can just generate a square that works exclusively on doubles without creation rules for this call site uh, using double instructions. And um, when... Uh, sorry, where am I? Clickers, weird. Okay, so what happens though? Cold site specialization is that I think my slides are a bit in disrepair. Okay, here we go. Uh, say now that someone t says that square is now a new function that takes an argument and returns uh, the argument plus a string. It suddenly changed from a square function to a string concatenator, but the cold site remains the same. So the new version of square is probably conservative bytecode and generated something like this. It takes an object, loads a string, does whatever the real uh, add semantic of JavaScript is, which is like 200 bytecodes probably, checking if like different types of different objects, doing figuring out the string concatenation we're working with and returning something that's a java like string in my bytecode. Um, but we can fix this, because we know that the call site still took the number 17 and used the return, uh, return value in a multiplication. So we can do something like bytecode that looks like this, a revert stub with the same semantics, takes double, returns a double, does the querations uh, to make sure that whatever we sent in are doubles, queries its return value to a double and return. And the best thing with method handles and method handle frameworks is that this bytecode, this doesn't exist at all. This is just me applying method handle filters to the call site. I say, put a filter on the zeroth argument and do the like double equation thing, put a filter to the return value that was an object and do the double equation thing. So just by doing a few method handle operations using the Java Lang invoke package and the new framework that we had around since Java 7, I can actually solve this situation pretty, pretty, good, pretty well for that call site. No one's ever going to overwrite string. And hopefully the compiler will take care of the like inlining the filters and everything like that, so it won't be too much overhead to use the fast version, which it turns out not to be. But static types, we had doubles there. They bring us performance, but looking at JavaScript source code, which is a dynamic language with no type declarations, uh, it's anyway too rare with static types to take us all the way performance-wise. I'm going to show you part of one of the Octane benchmarks, which is like the uh, inner function, the hotspot of the crypto benchmark. And we can look at this JavaScript code uh, statically with our compiler and infer a lot of stuff from it. You don't need to know exactly what this does. It's just a lot of bit operations and math. But the stuff that's bold here, we can tell that these things are ints, 32-bit ints. They can be represented as Java 32-bit ints because they're the result of a bitwise and with something that's less than 32 bits. They're the result of a bitwise shift and things like that. So all these, basically, if you don't do anything else with them, can be represented as Java, Java script, Java int for this JavaScript program. <clears throat> you look at some of the other arithmetic, even if you can't infer ints, you can say that, well, the red stuff here, they can surely be represented as double, because the minus minus operator and the multiplication operator, they can work on nothing else than numbers in JavaScript, and these are number operations. 
You can even add a pinch of static range analysis and say that, well, you know, XL up there, the assignment, um, 32 is wrong. It can't be more than 18 bits. And the other one is even smaller. Um, you can see the bit sizes because you, uh, you, you do a lot of bit operations with constants. So that means 12 bits and 18 bits and 12 bits. And then you know that this multiplication that multiplies things, uh, it can never overflow because you're not near 32 bits, which would cause it to overflow and, and, and have to represent it as something else. So you can say, well, that's an int multiplication because I'm guaranteed from looking at this statically that, uh, that these will be enough to represent as ints. But as you see, there's still some stuff we don't know anything about. We got six parameters to this this um, this call site to the, or to this method, and we, from different call sites, they can be different things. Sometimes they can be strings. They cause us trouble. So we we got somewhere with static analysis, and and, and like doing ints here instead of objects is probably a factor two or three faster than than it would have been just to like conservatively use objects in our bytecode for this JavaScript method. But in order to know everything about this method, we need to know the parameters as well. And we don't. We just see the call. So I mean, do I have to start writing my own inliner as well in my JavaScript runtime in Java? Sh shouldn't the JVM be doing that? I mean, um, we can look at call sites and, and, and see that, well, you use a constant here and a primitive number there for the first and third parameter. Um, but you can't always see that. You can only see that, well, this is called with x here. And, and, and that's an object as far as as me, the static compiler is conserved. So the runtime call site to this method, if it were correct, is actually, this is the signature in Java. It takes two objects, and the rest are ints. We knew this. But the static compiler cannot prove this ever. So I'm trying to make the point here that conservatively compiling something for JavaScript with conservative type guesses, it's never going to be enough. So I mean, we can ignore all primitive types and use boxing everywhere and, and, and object instructions and say, like, we're conservative. Um, the JVM is way too slow for that. There was nowhere near being able to cope with that amount of boxing and probably never will. Um, what, what, what can we do with static analysis? Well, we can do, as I said, we can use the primitives that we have. And um, that definitely gives us performance better than objects anyway, depending on the uh, amount of statically provable primitives, which usually is quite low. Can add some range checking. In this case, I showed you that another 30% or so, but it wasn't world beating. Uh, we can add like used stuff change to the uh, uh, control flow graph that we're building from our JavaScript AST to try to establish param types better. But I mean, this is sort of a lost battle. Um, this is turning into we're going to build our own native JavaScript runtime, and, and, and people already do that. So, so static analysis is not just the way to go if you want to implement this as bytecode. So we need to become adaptive, dynamic, and optimistic, like any adaptive runtime needs to be uh, these days. Looking at the AM3 method and the benchmarks, this is what our compiler could prove about the parameter types in the seven different call sites. This is what we could prove when, in fact, all of them looked like this with ints. But there's no way for us knowing it by just looking at the code. We know this, of course, while linking the program at runtime. Um, so every time we, we link a call site, the first time we call it, we can see what the arguments are. So we can generate an optimistic version of, of the AM3 method that I showed you using these parameters. But just because someone calls the method with an int right now doesn't mean someone will call it with an int later. Typical, typical example is that someone has a large int of lists with a, uh, an end of list, list of ints with an end of list marker, which is an undefined, which is, is, is an object in JavaScript. So, you can be right a million times, but it doesn't, happen if you, it doesn't help if you're wrong the million and one. So you can add, add guards to this call site using the method handle framework again, add a type check to see that this, this optimistic method, the optimistic assumption I made about the int, is that always true? And that's actually quite good, because that gets us like two times more the performance again. And, and now we're starting like, to get one foot into the dynamic optimistic territory. Uh, but we're still nowhere near a native VM like, like V8 would be anything like this. So we really want to use ints wherever we can. Uh, doubles is slower than ints, was my, well, was my case before. Um, but a simple thing like x++ has to pessimistically be a double operation if we're in the static world, because if we can't prove anything else, that's the only like, so the, the narrowest type guarantee to work. Uh, so in this little simple JavaScript program, we have a loop with a loop counter x. And 
we see x plus plus, and we can conservatively compile this to something where we represent x as a bytecode double that will always work, adding 1.0 every lap of the loop, uh, which of course is a stupid thing to do, but it's all we can see as the bytecode uh, um, to make the bytecode conservative enough for JavaScript. Um, if we change this double to an int, this, this function speeds up by a factor of 50. I benchmark this is because suddenly Hotspot starts doing optimization to it. It recognizes the plus plus as a loop counter, as a loop stride of one. It unrolls the loop. It does a lot of fancy code optimizations that it couldn't do before because of that double was in the way. So obviously, we really need to use ints whenever we can. And um, as all non-bitwise arithmetic in JavaScript can potentially overflow, the 32-bit nice Java ints won't be enough suddenly. Uh, and, and the plus operator, as I said, it can, it, it, it's the worst. It can take an object or a string or anything. Uh, we need to, to for how to implement this. We need to handle the overflows in some way if we decide to go with int as much as we can. So as an experiment, I'm not going to say I implemented a TypeScript front end to Nashorn, but I implemented something that looks like a very slim down version of a TypeScript front end, uh, which is basically, for those of you who don't know, a JavaScript extension that you can handle things like classes and types. And I declared things like ints here, ints there, and Nashorn immediately generates bytecode that has a lot more performance. It performs really well with primitive int types, uh, if, if we can prove them which has been the problem all this uh, talk that we can't. So um, first problem, as I said, is the overflow check overhead. Uh, at the top of the screen there is, is a function called add exact, which adds two Java integers, the 32 bit long, and uh, checks that the result did not overflow, which involves two XORs and an AND and, and, a, and a comparison with zero, which is maybe six or seven assembly instructions if you just naively compile it. And I can generate a JavaScript version like up that optimistically assumes x is an int and uses the add exact as my add function. And let's handle the case that we overflow later. But this is potentially, I mean, this would hope would be fast because it's int arithmetic. But the overflow check turns out that it makes it as pretty, pretty much as slow as the case when we had a double instruction. So this was, uh, was depressing to discover. But um, it could be solved because this add exact function is copied verbatim from the Java class libraries. Java Lang Math has them in eight. It has, it has um, operations for adding, subtracting, and multiplying things with overflow checks. And if it overflows, it casts an arithmetic exception. So we could intrinsify them because basically add exact, if you look at like how the optimal assembly for add exact would be, it's just an x86 and add instruction, jump an overflow to a failure place that throws the exception and um, return whatever the sum was otherwise. And it's never going to overflow, because if people use int, it tends to be int in JavaScript. It's very rare as anything else. So this is pretty good, because it's just about 10% slower than just using an iAd, just using the add without any overflow check when it doesn't, fall, doesn't fault. And it's twice the speed of the non-intrinsified version with the XORs. Uh, so this is only slightly faster than the dAd, but it enables everything, because the return value here is usually an int, and that will ripple down to other people, other functions, other applications that can also use this int. And then, if we switch to an int arithmetic world, I can guarantee you it's faster than anything else. So I wanted some more uh, um, intrinsics for common math operations in, in JDK 8. And um, I actually forgot to take out this slide, because the excellent guys in the Corelibs team implemented this for me. So now I have all the uh, um, Java arithmetic, or JavaScript arithmetic, as Java math operations in Java 8. So this is great. So looking at the bytecode for my add exact thingy here, um, which has been intrinsified in the assembly code, this is almost native fast. This is almost as fast as V8 does it, if you run the same JavaScript program on V8, um, which is pretty cool. So the key to the whole concept here was like, this is, looks a lot more like Java would do with ints, and uh, would use integer instructions on the assembly level, and be pretty slim. Um, one more optimization that we need to do is when you look at the loop invariant x less than y, y might, as you see, it's an invoked dynamic getter because we have no idea what it is. It can be something that has global side effects if someone's overridden value of, I don't know. But this is fairly simple static analysis. We can put like the primitive check out of the loop again if it turns out not to be a primitive for our comparison. 
um, something horrible will happen that I'm getting to, but it's not going to be that, because if you can compare an int with something in JavaScript, I mean, that gamble holds, but you have to handle the case that it doesn't. So if we just put the check out and bail if, if it turns out to be wrong, um, and just keep it in a local variable like this, this is native fast. This is as fast as V8 does it with, from bytecode. So this, this is pretty cool. Um, because Hotspot can't, like, it sees that in the uh, instruction there, get y, and it can't really tell if it has side effects or anything, even if it inlines it. Uh, it's not something you want to do every lap in the loop if you can avoid it. So here's our native fast code, all generated from bytecode by using some static analysis and some optimism. So another very common instance of the same problem is that you have a function in JavaScript, like function f there. I hope the font isn't too small. I should have bumped it up a bit, that takes a number 17 and adds an array element, array of 3, to it. And um, the bytecode, the conservative bytecode that you generate, we don't know anything about array. It's something in our scope. So, well, there's an element getter, and in order to make that make sure that works with whatever comes after, we return an object from the array. Even if it was an int array, which is most likely the case, it's going to be a boxed int for, for types to work. And, well, we can do an add operation, which is slightly less better, the, slightly better than the generic JavaScript add. We know that 17 is an int, at least, so we can have like an int constant, and then it could be anything, because we can't prove what the object is. And this is really common and really horribly slow in my static world here. So what I want to do is to get this instead. I want to switch out my conservative object array getter and my conservative adder to something that returns an int, I want to gamble that it's really an array full of ints, which is going to be, and do the invoke static math exact, which we've proven to be fast. But of course, it might not be ints in the array, so what do we do? I mean, if, if, if the array returns an object, we stand there with bytecode that seems an int, and everything depends on that, so we'll have verify errors. So it seems like a hard problem to solve. Um, what happens if we have an arithmetic operation that overflows? Or if we miss an assumption, if it really turned out to be an array full of strings and you wanted to concatenate all the strings with 17, and we just assume that we got ints back. So bytecode is strongly typed. I can't just like go in there and replace i add instructions with d add instructions. So we can't reuse the same code. So we have to throw errors or add guards to version the code whenever we deal with a return value that's uncertain. I might have to branch this code into the case, am I dealing with an object from the array, or am I dealing with an int from the array, or a double, or a long. Uh, it's going to bloat horribly for very branchy code. It's going to be completely unmanageable. Um, so I can't version code based on return types and copy code everywhere. So the only mechanism we have in bytecode that can help us here for asynchronous errors is, is the catch. So what we basically do is to have to add a catch block around every optimistic assumption we have, take a continuation of the state when the catch happens, and jump to a less specialized version of the code. Just continue from that continuation. And now he's like, uh-oh, he said continuation. This is, I mean, this is, well, what's, how, how, how are we going to get out of this? <laughs> but it turns out that, that we can actually get out of this. Uh, if we have bytecode that looks like this, Again, my font is small, but we load the array, uh, we load an index, um, and we have an optimistic getter that assumes that whatever is on this index is returns an int, and then continue with int arithmetic on it, and like pretend everything is ints, everything is fine. Um, what we can do with this uh, dynamic getter. It's an invoke dynamic, so we can put a lot of stuff available at com compile time in it. We can use the constant pool from the Java class file to put, say, flags on this invoke dynamic instruction at compile time, saying that this, I call this an optimistic call site, and I call this place where it's calling from program point 17, or whatever program point you mean. It's probably it's a trivial problem. You can just enumerate all invoke dynamics from the first the zero, one, two, three, so you can uniquely identify them as program points in the program. And then you add a return value filter, uh, throwing exception. We call this an unwarranted optimism exception in Nashorn, because there's a lot of unwarranted optimism in JavaScript. Uh, that contains things like, where did these, this assumption go wrong? Give me the program point ID, 
and give me the return value as an object, because obviously this wasn't an int, so it was a Java lang double or it was a string or whatever. Keep this in the exception. Take bytecode, take the bytecode and surround it with something like this, a try catch block for the unwarranted optimism exception. Um, if this happens, um, there's another quirk here. We have to make sure that the bytecode stack is written to when we execute an optimistic assumption because uh, exceptions in JavaScript, they break the bytecode stack. They don't break the local variables, however. So it's a little bit tricky, but we own the compiler, the bytecode compilers. We can make sure that all the state is in local bytecode variables. So we catch this exception um, and create a new exception with the program point ID return value and the state, the continuation state of the locals. This is not a full continuation, this is just like one frame. We need this to tell the linker to relink the method, generate the rest of the method after this program point, more pessimistically, like let it run through, generate the less optimistic version of the progr program or the, or the method and jump to it. So we just need it to unwind one stack frame. This is basically what you see here, on stack replacement in bytecode, which I don't think anyone has ever done before. But when you work with bytecode performance, you get desperate after a while. So turns out that it actually works really well. So we know when we're relinking a rewritable method, we just do like a method handle combinator again to the call site. They're always invoked with an invoke dynamic. Put an invoke dynamic catch exception in there, which will trigger a recompilation with a failed call site made more pessimistic. And in order to get there, we have to unwind the state from where we threw the exception, which means generating the rest of the method more conservatively, just like really slowly running through one lap, get the pessimistic return value, and then the next time this call is made, we call a less optimistic version of the method. And there is, of course, some warm-up problems to this, but it seems to work really well. It gets us the performance we need for everything is mostly into the arithmetic, even if you, don't have, if you can't prove it. So I'm going to finish off talking a little bit about the JVM situation. Um, Java 7 was the first JVM implementation where we had Invoke Dynamic. And not many people in here had worked with it, but people like me and Charlie Nutter who did, and everyone on the mailing list were quite aware of the famous or the infamous no class that found error bug, which basically threw new class that found errors um, af after a while if you manipulated too many method handles. And this could be circumvented only by running with everything completely insecure in the boot class path. Um, so for Java 8, a lot of C++, that was the original uh, method handle implementation, were rewritten in Java and re-implemented as something called Lambda forms, which is the inner workings of a method handle that are Java classes in the Java Lang invoke package internally and not specified. And initially, when we started to try these releases, we got down to 10% of whatever performance we have in Java 7. So there's been a lot of despair throughout this project. And some of you may have gone to Charlie Nutter's presentation at other venues, and um, then you know that an invoked dynamic stack trace in Java 8, in this case for just calling math round, looks for some reason like this. <laughs> so that's a big WTF right there, from the main function down to the math round implementation. We have lambda form, lambda form, lambda form, lambda form. These generate their own bytecode, they weave their own bytecode, which in turn is implemented, which, is ter which in turn is compiled uh, and, and inlined into, uh, in, into the IR for the original method in Hotspot. And I think the design had to do with um, portability, because you got a lot of Java for all platforms, and that the C2 compiler in Hotspot really sucks with IR. You can't just take IR and splice it in in any, any way that makes sense. So this is the way it ended up. So obviously, it needs to be some optimization efforts here. The guys originally in the compiler team were like, yeah, 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 we'll just fix the inliner and everything will be fine. But of course, the world is not that simple. This is a slide I borrowed from Charlie. He wants me to evangelize it whenever I see it. It's from Fosdem 2013 when he says like his first Java 8 Lambda form experience is foo calling bar, calling baz, calling sleep. So the first question that we had to ask hotspot when it came to dynamic dynamic calls and invoke dynamic is why you know inline? We had this mindset for almost a year while the coding guys and us helped each other out trying to sort out the inlining problems. But even for normal Java code, there's inlining problems, at least if you use hotspot or traditionally uh, hotspot since last year, because I mean, you probably noticed this in Java programs, you add one line of code, 
in some function and suddenly 50% of your performance disappears from your program. At least I've noticed that. And that's because I've seen that from time to time with Hotspot. And this is relevant in our quick code paths in the Nashorn Java code as well. And this is because Hotspot had like a sharp upper inline limit where suddenly it stopped inlining. Uh, JRocket never did it that way. We had incremental inlining. So basically, as long as we have time left and can shrink the code mass and bring more code in, we will which is something that uh, Hotspot had to implement uh, with uh, uh, these Lambda form stack traces being the driving case. Uh, so Lambda forms and method handles, they put tremendous pressure on the inlining. Um, and also on the meta space, the metadata in the machine used to be in the perm gem, but it's the meta space I'm getting there. Yeah. And we also discovered a few very old bugs in the C2 inliner, for example, that dead nodes counted its size that had been there for 10 years and no one had known about. Uh, so. Roland on the compiler team he pushed incremental inlining last Christmas and that doubled pretty much all invoked dynamic performance that was immediately. So that was quite a heroic little feat. Uh, of course, there's some other things left like warm up and scalability and metaspace, which replaced permgen. Uh, because Lambda forms that are parts of the method handle, they compile a lot of code and generate a lot of stress on the metadata in the system. Um, so if we have to have Lambda forms, I'm not sure. At least currently, the jury is out on this. I'm not sure they can remain in bytecode land because basically we added a whole new JIT compiler. Even if an invoke dynamic call cost us zero CPU cycles, all the metadata around it, having to generate the lambda form, its classes, compiling the bytecode, takes us time. So it's not the most efficient way of implementing invoke dynamic. That, that is sure. Um, and inlining, despite tweaking, has a lot of problems that remain to be solved, like type profiling and stuff. You can share Lambda forms, like now, now Hotspot compiles the same Lambda form for two identical but different call sites, and you could share that, but that opens up a can of worms with profiling data that you don't have and so on. And then it's boxing removal, because there's a lot of implicit boxing going on in the method handle APIs. It says object, but it's really Java lang double or Java lang int, and Hotspot only does global escape analysis, which is sort of the facilitator for boxing. And, uh, it's really hard to get rid of all the boxing that we need to get rid of, and, and we have a really good guy working on this, but it's, it's again, uh, Hotspot uses a transform domain where it's really hard to get certain things working, and this is one of them. Very simple to get other things working, but very hard to get things like this working. We have the method handle invoker. I'm just going to skip past this, and I'm running out of time. When you invoke something, uh, from Java with method handle, the reflection equivalent is pretty slow. Your typical JavaScript apply is done like that, it's slow. Um, small code to look at, but basically JRocket could turn this into return 140 and Hotspot isn't there yet. But that's, that I think the changes were pushed that actually made some really great improvements for uh, uh, method handle invoke uh, last week. And we have to do stuff like this in our Java code, still to get around the inlining and boxing stuff. Like don't read it, but don't bother to read this code, but here's three methods. and. Uh, they look fairly similar to you, don't they? We just have to have these three copies to get rid of the boxing that otherwise would actually add 15% performance overhead or so. So even as a Java program, we have to care about what the JIT does, which is a bit sad. Uh, so warm up. Invoke dynamic needs bootstrapping, as Brian said. Every call site contributes to warm up. The first time it's called, we have to set it up. Lambda forms, as you see, contribute to code generation and warm up. Tiered compilation, which is a technique that Hotspot uses to either run the fast compiler C1 that produces worse code than the slow compiler C2, which is the second step, added even more standard deviation. So it's been really hard to measure this thing, what's fast and what's not fast. We have the meta space. Some people might cheer, including me, to know that permgen is a thing of the past for Java 7. No more permgen errors. We we'll use native off-heap memory that will uh, grow in order to um, accommodate metadata, not uh, the permgen on-heap thing that you can never be sure how much you needed. Uh, but during the development, it turns out the runtime team didn't know about some of the intricate details of the Lambda form implementation called anonymous classes, not the anonymous classes that you're used to, but something internally in the VMs. We had like 15 broken builds there for a while, which stressed us out mightily. We had problems with compressed class pointers, which gave us a fixed like chunks of memory that we ran out of. And like being the world's bleeding edge invoked dynamic consumer with the VM, not having seen these kind of patterns before was, was really uh, not a fun ride. We had a lot of meta space fragmentation. But the good thing is that we were able to help the memory team with reproducers and help them fix all these kinds of things. So, so 
I think all of them are fixed or in the process of being fixed right now. So what we have to do for Nashorn, currently Nashorn, if you take down a JDK 8 build, doesn't do this optimistic, fast uh, type guessing thing. Uh, it currently lives in a sandbox that will go in there, hopefully before uh, Java 8 first release. Otherwise, it'll be an update release. Uh, Forward-looking statements, you saw the legal slide, I can't mean, might, might not as well happen, but I, we hope that's the plan. Uh, we want to add some static analysis, uh, some better representation so we can make even better type guesses. Uh, we want to play more with the JVM internals so we can do something like uh, tagged objects, much like native JavaScript runtimes do, so that you have a, a, a structure that the garbage collector is aware of for an object or a field that you can check is this um, an object or is this an int or a long or a double, but it just looks like an object field or an object array. So we had a discussion on the multi language mailing list, which is in the OpenJDK as well, about something we call sun mis tagged array and, and Ricker is in the audience here somewhere hacked up a prototype. Parallelism is also nice. Um, there's plenty of parallel frameworks like web workers and stuff that try to present parallelism in an implicit way in JavaScript. So uh, to the user, probably want to do something like that. Um, boxing removal in the JVM, intrinsic lambda form caching. I talked about all these things that need to be improved in the JVM. Maybe even bytecode is not the correct format to do this in. If I like wax poetically and look into the future, what would we like? How would it work? Maybe we should have pluggable front ends for the JVM for different languages. There's research going on into that, but then we're talking Java 10, Java 11. Uh, it would be fun if I could talk to my compiler, in this case being the JIT, or my JIT could talk back to me and said, basically, here are your types. You were just special, you were just optimized. So I'll, I'll just conclude with like showing how, how, how good this optimistic type approach uh, worked. After about two and a half weeks of work, we took the AIM-3 method that I showed you before and, and ran it, uh, turned it to micro benchmark and ran it. So the old Rhino, there's no problem beating the old Rhino, did this in 34 seconds. Nasworn in Java 8 did it in 10, 11 seconds, and V8 did it in 1.3 seconds, which is certainly a very discouraging thing, uh, data to look at with native runtimes compared to uh, Java runtimes. Um, so we added optimistic types, 5.8 seconds. Uh, Rick had intrinsified the math methods the way I explained them, 4.4 seconds. We added some type profiling to the inliner, 2.5 seconds. So it's really not that hard if you get the optimistic framework up and running, and, and it's definitely comparable to native speeds. So that is why uh, HR will send a stern note to my boss saying that Marcus doesn't take his vacation days which they, they, they seriously, they do that. So if you want to know more, if you want to know more info, you can talk to the team that's been like the multi-language team. We're on Twitter. Uh, there is a Nazarene blog where we post news and you, if you have some cool project there, we would invite you to guest blog if you send us information about it. If you use Nazarene for hybrid operations, uh, there's a guy in Australia who done some really cool Java FX things using like a Java FX canvas as a JavaScript canvas and got a frame rate that was was better than Chrome because JavaFX apparently kicks ass. I didn't know that. There's two mailing lists, NAS on dev, MLVM dev on the open Java, oh, JDK uh, list that you can follow and ask questions on. Um, that's basically all I had. Sorry if I had uh, ran a little bit over time, but George said I should take it slowly. And Thank in you. fact, um, I was just going to address that because as you all know, it's lunch directly after this. Um, however, I know is so smart that she said, we're going to time things so that no one has to wait in, in line a really long time. So of course, you would much rather be here asking questions about Nashorn uh, than standing in a boring line waiting for lunch. Um, and we do have a few questions. Cool. Um, I don't dare to update this because I've heard horror stories. So I'm going to take the questions that are here. Um, and I know some people had problems posting also. Um, so if, if you have a question and, and uh, it's not on here, you can just raise your hand and I'll come with Mike. Um, but let's go ahead and start here. I'll give you, uh, of course, it times out. Okay. I will let you uh, The machine get of started. horror. And I, I think there are a couple of those that are essentially the same Yes, question. some of them are the same. How does native performance compare to, not some performance compared to the native JavaScript implementation? Well, you saw that. We're getting there. We're working on it. Um, with regard to int overflow check-in, could the JVM JIT be taught to optimize that into just checking the overflow flag? Yes, I think that's what we did, right? 
how big is my bytecode program going to be after compiling some JS program? Well, it depends. It certainly can produce bigger bytecode than Java. Java has a limit of uh, 64k bytecode per method, uh, but we won't crash. We'll split it into several smaller methods, though, which, of course, is a little bit harmful on performance. But uh, as far as we've been able to notice, for normal script, size hasn't really been an issue. How does NAS or in Hotspot compare to V8? I think I covered that. Do you think you'll achieve V8 performance? Well, unless we do things like um, tagged values that I was talking about in the end, I don't think for pure number crunching like crypto that we'll ever achieve V8 performance, but I think we can get pretty damn close. close. And for things like Avatar.js, which is a node-like implementation, running HTTP server stuff there, we're already in the same ballpark. So. We shouldn't stare ourselves blind too much as like cycle counting benchmarks, but some of them are already as fast as V8, such as Splay. So apples and oranges a little bit, but I don't think, I mean, I was really, I really didn't think we'd get this far with regard to, to like approaching native performance when this project started. But uh, when we started doing the optimistic infrastructure described here, I, I, I actually started to realize that um, maybe it can be done after all. I would like to ask, are you uh, going to supply a DOM implementation as well? A what? A DOM, an, a DOM implementation, a uh, web uh, browser implementation uh, as well in the JDK? Currently, there are no plans for that, but please contribute. <laughs> I don't think it's a simple uh, No, it's not simple. Um, we'll, s we'll see what projects the future will bring. I can, say, I can only say that we're not working on it right now. So what about ASM.js? Do you have any plans for that, and do you think that will be performant? I think ASM.js is a rather, uh, rather bad compromise uh, when it comes to getting performance. I would, what I'd like to do, what's actually talked about for the roadmaps, is like I'd like to do some kind of statically typed front end instead. It might or might not be a TypeScript front end, but uh, if we can get type info, Nasrin is fast. And if we can get like conservatively static compile time known type info, Nasrin is fast. So. Anyone who wants to be a thesis student in Stockholm for six months or knows anyone who wants to be, so come, come on over and I'll put you to work. So. I think you scared them all off with the slides in the beginning about that. Okay, any further questions? Okay, thank you everyone and please remember to rate the session. Thank you.